Hi, my name is Anthony Stokes. I'm the writer and creator of The K. You can find me on Twitter at Stokes the Writer. You can find me at Instagram at Instagram.com forward slash The K Comic. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented creator. He is only the second comic creator I've had on the show in 14 years that has ever dealt with voodoo. And if that doesn't pique your interest, then why are you watching? You should be watching this interview. You should be sort of supporting this creator because we are joined today by the ever talented Anthony Stokes from the comic decay. How are you doing today? I'm doing so good. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no problem, man. No problem. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a, as a writer and as a creative person, tell us who you are and, and what you are bringing to two geeks talking today. I'd be curious because you talk to a lot of creators, if this is the case commonly, but my first love is movies. I was just in love. It's how I relate to my dad. You know, he was a sports fan and I'm, I'm, you can't, I'm like six one, you know, I was a big kid. They're like, do you like to play sports? Like, and I like to read, you know, Naruto <laughs> and we relate to each other through movies. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that really got my passion for it. And I just been writing for a really long time, writing, writing screenplays, TV pilots and all that stuff, you know, amateur, nothing that ever got picked up. And then I had seen, I don't know when I got the idea for a comic. I read a lot of manga as well, like Naruto one piece as well. Okay. That's where I got my love for the visual medium. And I said, let me make a comic book. I would want to consider myself a storyteller. And I, I would hope that I could write in on the, on the best conditions in any medium. I think what I try to bring from my screenwriting is a lot of visual storytelling and an emphasis on good dialogue. And that's what I enjoyed about the actual reading through issues one and two that, that you happen to send me, which I, I greatly appreciate. Um, I love the fact that you have great character development in a tight space of time because 20 some odd pages is very, it's comic book normal, but to tell a story in that short of a, a time period is, is difficult. It can be difficult. You've definitely done a great job with the flow of the characters and, and the stories and the interactions. And you dive into some, some deeper topics as well, which I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the themes going forward. But as a, as a writer, you have to be creative. Like I've dabbled in screenplays as well, too. I've dabbled in, in producing short films and everything like that. So I, I love the fact that looking at the visual mediums of, of manga and, and comics and film, you know, to express yourself as a creative person is always a great thing to see. Yeah, I want to be, I say genreless. I say storytelling as a language. So if you understand storytelling, you can really work in screenplays and write novels and maybe, maybe not to the same success. There are definitely difficulties. I definitely made adjustments. I sent a, uh, a script out to Brandon Owens, who wrote Arcana. Really good, really good comic book. Shouts out to Brandon. And he said, look, brother, this is great dialogue, but it, it's way too much. And I was like, okay, cool. I had my script and I said, okay, if it doesn't need to be said, I'm not going to have them say it. And that did two things. It really made me lean on visual storytelling. And also, I don't like too many speech bubbles, too much text. And my comic book, I like, you know, you want to see the art, right? Well, it had a double effect. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm paying for the art. I want people to see it. Why would I cover it up? I think it lended itself to being like, hopefully really atmospheric with <laughs> the sparse dialogue. I hope that that was achieved. It's the classic movie adage of show, don't tell. You have a single page of action is a single page of a script. So it works out well. And, and those that have studied film and television and, and comics as well, too, you understand that silence is sometimes the best form of showcasing what you need to show rather than, like you said, covering it with dialogue. Yeah. And exposition, a lack of exposition was huge as well. I'm curious because some people miss some of the details their parents is brother and sister. Mm -hmm. Did you figure out how their parents died from reading the, reading the comic book? For my limited time, I got to read it. Mm -hmm. I, That's true. For me, I think it would, I would dive into the details a little more when I get a second read through. Okay. Because I was trying to get through the, the story and see the connections. So Fair enough. Um, a little bit of spoiler. So they're looking at above ground graves in New mm -hmm. Orleans because the, because of the water, the ground is too soft. And it's a brother and sister. Um, they're at their parents' graves. The, the brother is like, all this from water, essentially. And the sister is like, well, it's a lot of water. So that was alluding to Hurricane Katrina. Mm. 
that's one of my favorite lines in the comic book because you know it's it's super so, so subtle a lot of people like miss especially if you're reading you know you we you have another interview today you know you read like, like you know it's all good to just get something done but a lot of people miss that which i don't have a problem with you know like i, I would rather give you give you little details that you have to reread to fully understand i think that's so much better than saying like oh well it sucks mom and dad died in hurricane katrina you know it was super important to have the story feel organic to me while I was writing it. Especially if you're doing a multi-issue story and a multi-issue series. I mean, throwing in these little tidbits and subtleties are, are necessary because it allows the person like myself to go back and reread it through a second, third, fourth time. Because now you're looking for connections to future events and future aspects. Um, I, I think that it's it's an underutilized skill that not many people do because a lot of times creative people in general, not not saying yourself, I'm saying in general, they're usually just one and done. And and that's fine if you have a tight story and you want to be creative in that respect. But I think that, you know, if you're going for a longer form for a longer format, longer form, that you know, the subtleties of writing, the subtleties of, of character interactions are are necessary to keep interest yeah i looked at it like i was telling it's a five issue oh okay. i would i guess you call that mini series mm -hmm. i didn't look at it like i'm telling five different stories i looked at it like i'm telling one story that is broken up five times essentially of course you want to make something that's narratively satisfying like i look at it like i tell myself rent is due every day you know the the people that are gracious enough to read my comic book and really enjoy the story I would to them to deliver a, a, a satisfying story so that they can. I, I want to make it easy for people to be a fan, essentially, is what I'm trying to say. Well, I, I, and I think you accomplished that. I mean, two issues in, I mean, you have a lot of story to tell. You have three more to go. So mm -hmm. I, I can't wait to see what's going to happen in the future. So that is one thing that will keep me coming back. And I'm sure it'll keep many people coming back as well, too. Looking at the the creation of the world, I think is is more central to a creative person's mindset than it is creating the people first. Because if you can't create the world, you have really no base of how you can evolve as a creative person. Is that true for you as well? Yes, absolutely. I have a question for you. Is having something be low premise, is that a form of world building? How so? All right. So let's say um, you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah. So that doesn't have like that's 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 just Larry David acting like a jackass, essentially. Yeah. Is that a form of world building? You know, because we it has an established set of rules like, OK, this is real life, but it's like it's it's slightly off kilter. You know, things happen. Is that we, we know that world building can be like, you know, superheroes and monsters and stuff like that. Is that a form of world building? Is low premise? Because while there is world building, at least issue one is pretty set in human drama i would say it is because you can even take other examples of even seinfeld to a certain extent you can take examples to to mash that's that's low form because you never really saw anything outside of the hospital itself mm -hmm. uh for the most part but you you see other film uh, other series like family matters or anything along that line i mean there you, you saw glimpses of worlds that they were a part of, but you never saw the full picture. You never saw any real political economical aspects of it. You you saw your characters, you saw the the bubble that they were in and uh, how they've created their their lifestyle. Similar with your comics as well too. You know, you get a glimpse of of the world that is New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I've never been down south, so I, I as far I've gone as far south as Kentucky. So that's as far south as I've I've gone. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about New Orleans. So I can I can see the area you're you're talking about the how these characters are do, are interacting with each other. You see conflict. You see um, beef. You see everything along that line. So you are building your world. Mm -hmm. I'm just we're just seeing a small glimpse of it. So. Yeah, it doesn't have to be superheroes in outer space and everything along that along that line. But your the themes that you're drawing from the world you've created are definitely a part of this, and that's what makes your story interesting. Okay, good. Yeah, I just I want I think that's important for people to know that world building does include sometimes sometimes just our world, but slightly slightly different. Yeah, for sure. 
the nameology when it comes to the actual names of your characters themselves. I mean, you're rooted in reality, which is a good thing. You don't have to draw some from some high elf fantasy type thing mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, how did you come up with the names of your characters? Because that I always find the most fascinating about yourself as a creative person. What's interesting is the the main character isn't named in the in the ish first issue. Um, I think only one, I think only a couple of characters were named. Mm -hmm. um, it goes back to that natural storytelling. There are people, especially if you go, because there's a party. If you go to a party, there's people, there's parties and people that I've met that have, that have a profound effect on me. Like, just think about what they said. I don't know their name. I didn't think I needed to say, hey, this, the, the main character's name is DK. And it's kind of a pun. <laughs> I wish I had a deeper, I wish I had a deeper kind of like thought process. but. I guess that does say something about me that character name is not a big emphasis for me personally. I'm worried more about the characters, not to say that you can't do both, right? You can actually character build and have somebody be an interesting name, but that was just not where my mental, my mental space was. And yeah, it's DK is basically a pun. Like, I don't know if I was doing it again, if I would name him that, but I was like, well, I got to name this guy something DK. Sure. You know, that's a good question. It's definitely a good question. What, the name question? The, the nameology is definitely, definitely a good question. That, that might be something I consider like going forward. And this is something I, I learned when I went back to school for, for film and, and, and art. And when it comes to script writing specifically, and I'm, you're well aware of it, a script is never really complete until you have the header title of your character name. You can have man one, woman one, woman two, man two, et cetera, but it doesn't give you clear direction it just gives you a place right. hole we were always forced to name our characters no matter how shitty the names were we still had to name them no matter what because that just set up you know your guide of of how your characters are going to actively interact and maybe a name itself offers a different path that you maybe have not thought of when you initially started writing your scripts because you know dk like you said it was it was a joke at at one point but mm. it, it's now the guide of your series of your character that you're you're interacting when you're pathing out your scripting when it comes to the next couple of issues though you know that's that's your focal point for the most part i mean you mm -hmm. obviously have offshoots here but looking at the path from once you got this idea how specifically did you get the idea and how did it evolve into your current issues i can't truly say because it would it'd be a i, I started from the ending it, there's going to be a very grim ending for, for Decay. Okay. So I worked backwards from the mechanics and it was, it had to do with an undead. And I was like, okay, undead. I am a filmmaker at heart. You know, I love comics and I, I, I will make comics for the rest of my life, but I'm, I'm trying to make a movie, you know? So I was like, all right, you get tax credits for filming in New Orleans, New Orleans, voodoo. Okay. And then I was like, I, I love Frankenstein which is a huge influence. So I was like, okay, so it kind of all, it all, it kind of, it kind of came together. And then after that, it was kind of like, okay, I got to put these characters in a dangerous situation. Why? Okay. They're bartending at a party. Okay. The, there's an undead. Somebody has to act, interact with them. I said, okay, I'll make the sister a mortician. It kind of like unfolded very organically. I'm actually a little bit worried my next couple, like my next stories, like decay kind of just, um, it almost just fell out of like the sky and it fit like the per pieces fit so perfectly. I'm really nervous for my next projects that they won't fit as organic. Uh, essentially the undead led to the voodoo, which led to the new Orleans. And then that's, that's how we got here. Don't look a gift horse when you get a, a nice, easy initial calm, like when you, and when it comes to, to putting out, a, especially Kickstarter campaign as well, too, mm -hmm. which we haven't touched upon yet. Um, and the fact that it's, it's a, it's an organic story. Like you said, those are usually the best because they're mm -hmm. an easy read. You, you have great art. You have, like I said, great characters earlier on, and you're going to make this into five issues. So I, I'd love to see it from beginning to end. Once you get your entire story put together, I'd love to see the, the interactions and, and the fan reactions, I should say to what's been put together, especially those that are supporting you. And of course, through this Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I, I'm definitely gonna do like a trade back and that's going to be my favorite campaign where I just have to like put all the work together 
and then sell it again. Like I can't, I cannot wait. Well, I, have you ever done a Kickstarter before though? I did for issue one. Looking at issue one then and your upcoming campaign, obviously current in this current month, well, what mistakes did you make in the first one that you're like, right, I'm never go. gonna do that shit? I did everything backwards. I'm discovering I wanna make comic books and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna do a Kickstarter. I don't know where I got the idea for Kickstarter, but I knew it existed somewhere. So I did all the research in the world on how to do a Kickstarter. So a lot of stuff is like, all right, you gotta do this, this, that, that. And I was like, okay, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do add-ons, I'm not gonna do my stretch goals were stuff that's all all digital rewards. I had the Kickstarter stuff down. And it, honestly, there's not much different from issue one to two. Uh, full disclosure, I just hit copy and paste for issue two and then kind of like made adjustments and, and updated the photos and stuff like that. So I nailed that. The problem was uh, with the actual making of a comic book. I did next to no research on that because there's so many resources about how to make a comic book or excuse me, how to make a Kickstarter. But I, I feel like there's a real lack of resources about how to make a comic book. It's like, I didn't know about margins. I was lucky to find out about media mail. I was very lucky to find that out. I'm working with the case you won. Look, you got to love all your children. The case you won is definitely like good. I, I love it. I love the product but it's rough around the edges, which I like because that gives you an opportunity to get better. And I do think the case you, it too is, is better in every way, which is what you would want. I didn't know about exporting the CMYK, that printers can only print in CMYKs. I didn't know about printing margins. So I had to have somebody add like a black border to the JPEGs to make it fit the bleed area. That was the big thing. That cost me $300. I had, to, I had to pay somebody to fix that. Now I know people, when I touch they're like, oh, I would have done that for you for free. But I'm like, shit, I didn't know you uh, eight months ago. You know, where were you? I think there's so many resources out for a Kickstarter. And I hate when I see a Kickstarter that's kind of hastily thrown together because I'm like, Kickstarter will tell you what to do, you know? They'll give you articles. If you if you post a project Kickstarter and you're like, uh, this is, I don't know. Hey, here's a here's a bunch of links. Read this. You know, we're not gonna tell you what to do, but hey, this might be a good idea. So going from issue one to two, the main thing was like the technical side, the boring stuff, like the margins and and yeah. and, and stuff like that. so a big point of emphasis for me in my creative process is I'm I'm doing everything myself. Yeah. I'm not doing the art. The artist is Marcelo. He's amazing. I, I love the love that guy. And then my friend Stephen Coke um, from Comics to Movies. He did the lettering. But everything else is me. So it's like self distributed. It's self published. You know, edited all that other stuff. So to me, my creative process is about being fluid. Um, I think about what Bruce Lee said: like be water. It's like, I got to kind of turn into whatever I need to get my project out there. So when I said I had it backwards, I found my audience after issue one was released. Now, if I had released a Kickstarter for issue one, I would have gotten way more, way more, so way more money, way more shares. It was learning. It was a learning thing. But now that I have the infrastructure that I have the fans, I'm going to be way better off. So I want to, I just want everybody to be fluid. I want everybody to try to update their creative process and update their methods to make sure that they're doing the best thing for themselves and for their product. So then what's your creative kryptonite? Grammar. You were saying earlier about how, so I didn't go to film school. I don't have any formal training in writing. I om almost entirely self-taught. When I discovered I wanted to make movies, really, I was a freshman in high school. I'd seen Superbad and Inglorious Bastard the same <laughs> summer. I need to make these. This is what I want to do. And I was like, okay. So I started, I would watch video essays. Like that was entertainment for me. I would just watch video essays about every, that's kind of where I got my education from. So I'm really rough around the edges. I consider me my, I almost like the bad news bears, you know, when I'm writing a script, I'm writing it well enough to that the people, the, the beta readers, they can understand and give me feedback. Like that's it. It is no real polish. I'll have characters unnamed. Like I'm just, I'm just flying through because I want to get, like I have, I've had decay written in its entirety for a year. Oh wow. Yeah. So I work really fast. It's good for now. For now that works. My friend complained about grammar. I don't care about grammar. I, really, I still, <laughs> that's what editors are for. They worry about grammar. When I go to try to get some stuff published, when I try to take that next step into my career, hopefully then I will have to kind of go back and, and clean some stuff up. But what you were saying earlier about your teacher making you name every single character, I'm like, like, that's a great, that's a great tool. 
to, to that's, that's really interesting. You know, those are the kind of things that I, I think I could have picked up and from, from a film school, little tips and little, little finesses that can definitely help the writing. Being self-taught is not a bad thing whatsoever because you're learning from professionals that have already been in the industry for decades. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, you see the styles that you enjoy, like the style between from super bad to Tarantino's and glorious bastards are two completely different styles. And because of that, like I told you, dialogue was my, was my, I love, I'm, obsessed with dialogue i love i fucking love dialogue so you get two different spectrums you get the judd apatow which is like really naturalistic Mm -hmm. almost like a lot of improv like real two real people talking you get the opposite where it's tarantino where it's pretty much a cartoon that allowed me to i'm gonna throw aaron sorkin in there too that allowed me to be like again like shapeless like genreless you know i can write in any style of dialogue now like decay Issue one and two, Decay issue two barely has any dialogue. Uh, my letterer knocked down the price. He was like, look, there's there's one speech bubble on this page. I'm not going to charge you the full 10. I was proud of myself that I love this thing. Like this, I love dialogue, but I can't even showcase it just yet. You know, like I can't even show like, so it took a lot of discipline to get to that point. But self being self-taught, it taught me to be self-sufficient. Yeah. Was very important. And it, it really, uh, I would say it put a chip on my shoulder, like, I was like, man, I'm not getting the peer reviews. Even getting people to read scripts was this this huge battle. Like, I just posted, like, somebody read a script. I want to get better. Somebody help me. And in the last couple of years, thankfully, people started reading it. And that gave me the confidence to keep to keep going. I'm not knocking a formal entertain- education at all. I'm just telling, like, from my process, what, what I did. And I really wouldn't change anything. And I also did the master class. Yeah, I watched the master class. Awesome. Aaron Sorkin. Yeah, I have that too. Mars Scorsese did one. Yeah. There's one with Neil Gaiman. There's David Lynch as well, too. Even the Aaron Sorkin one, I was like, look, I can watch this damn master class a hundred times. I'm not gonna be Aaron Sorkin. No. <laughs> you know, it's like that's that like that innate talent is like almost godlike from my perspective, of like you started an entire genre of mm-hmm. dialogue. Like him and Tarantino, it's like I'm just a mortal trying to like hopefully be if if I could be a good imitation of Quentin Tarantino, that's money in the bank, you know. Like that's like they're, they're just they're just so impressive. One thing I took away from Quentin Tarantino was he doesn't his exposition is very it's very subtle, it's very smooth. Mm. And when you get introduced to character in a Quentin Tarantino movie, you you already know what they're about from almost the first frame that they're introduced you know the costumes tell a story it's a care it's a it's probably a character actor that you've seen before like uh pam greer you know yeah. it, it's it's john travolta sam jackson like we know it, and it's the music they listen to you know and that was something i was like because because you said it's 28 pages it's like yeah i'm i'm trying to like maximize every page and there are pages that are splash pages like there i think that was a conscious choice of like, okay, I need a splash page here. It can't be nine panels. You got to like let people breathe. You got to show some of this art, some of this locale. We introduced the sister Jess in one page. And I'm hoping in that one page that you understand her. What can we get from that page? Like, okay, she's kind of morbid, but in a good way, very nice, very plucky person. She works in a morgue. She's kind of off. Like we get that from one page along with the visual joke. Like that was super important to me to try to tell it so efficiently, especially when I can't do that or I'm paying by the page for the art, for the lettering, for the printing and, and et cetera. So that was a big point of emphasis. Yeah, I think for me, when you introduced the the Jess character there, for sure, it was it, the, what really struck me was the care she took when it came to just even humanely like putting on lipstick to Mm -hmm. the body itself and and you felt the caring nature of that character just in three panels i thought Mm -hmm. it was i thought it was beautiful truly yeah it's supposed to be like a visual joke like oh you think it's somebody put and then it's it turns out that she's putting on a corpse even if the visual joke doesn't work yeah it's it's a lot of storytelling it it, it sets up so much that's my my thing is how can i squeeze as much information into visually how can I squeeze as much information into one page as possible? So that when you do that, you can have a splash page. Like I, there's a couple of splash pages in the case you too that I think are great. And it was, it was like, I want, I want people to take a breath, you know? what do you think about the pacing, by the way? 
It was it was fast. To, yes. to, to be fair, it, it was <laughs> it was, it was, it, was it, it was super fast. This is literally the fastest I've been able to read a comic in a while because a couple of reasons, and, and I'm sure you're well aware of it because you created it. Yeah. The lack of dialogue mm-hmm. was not a bad thing. The action you can whip through in under 30 seconds mm-hmm. because you're going bam, 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 bam. The dialogue, as sparse as it was, still told the story. Your character interactions were still there, but it was a super fast. Other than the first couple of pages of issue one, the rest just flew through. Mm-hmm. And it's not about that. When you, I think when you read it from issue one to issue five, you'll understand that there's a lot more that we're not seeing yet. That's why I'm kind of reserving my judgment for the other three issues because you have more story to tell and I can tell that, but I want to see it. The pacing is a matter of taste. I'm not going to get mad. Like, look, like I said, this, I said it's rough around the edges. Like I'm, I'm very confident in my skills. Like this is not my magnum opus, you know, I'm hoping this is the reservoir dogs to my later Pulp Fiction, you know, like that's what I'm hoping. So it's, it's totally fine. If that's the worst thing about your comic book, that it's a brisk read, you know, I used to read manga Naruto. I'd flip through a, a, a volume of Naruto in like 20 minutes. So I guess I just kind of brought that, but I would have rather it be that than like, damn, this has, this shit has a lot of bubbles. <laughs> like I got to read a lot. I was, I was reading this. Uh, I was, I'm in a lot of uh, comic book groups and this guy posted a, a, a two page side by side page and it had like the entire left page was just speech bubbles and then the the second half of the second like this half of this page to the left is just spe- speech bubbles and somebody was like um you got some comic in your novel and uh <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna tell that story every podcast because it was it was just so it was so true mm-hmm. you know i'd rather be a brisk read and you want more and and this wasn't intentional. That feeling of one, you can you can breeze through it and then you can reread it and look for the nuances and look for the little moments and stuff like that. Also, that makes you want more. You know, it's like eating a, hopefully it's like eating a potato chip, you know, mm-hmm. like theoretically, you know what I'm saying? So I think that's a completely fair fair criticism. The only thing that annoys me, I'm sure you know, you understand, you talk to comic readers. More pages makes takes more money. Should I should I add more dialogue that I don't need to like increase the should I add more pages? I gotta pay, you know, you gotta print by four pages. So I'm supposed to add four pages of stuff that I don't think is necessary. So you feel like you got your time's worth or your money's worth. I'm just not gonna do that. It's not people in the comic book industry, it's people that don't even read comic books that I'm very grateful that, hey, thanks for picking this up. You do have a lack of perspective. From a business perspective thing, every book that you've ever picked up, whether it's a comic book or whether it's uh, an actual novel or whether it's a self-help book or whatever the hell it is, it costs money to make. You're limited to what you can afford. You're limited to paying your artists and, and your other ear anchors and everything along that line. You're, you have a team that you are paying and you're also paying to get the book pulp. Time mm-hmm. is money. Time is a big thing too. Cause exactly. that one page takes a week. If that's the very worst thing, I'm like, man, I did, I think I did a pretty good job for a debut, you know, mm-hmm. cause I've read comic books that are unfortunately like unreadable. <laughs> And it's really, it's really sad because you're like, man, this art is great. And you covered it up with all this text, man. Like you got to learn from your mistakes and other people's, at least what I would deem a mistake. So I'm not trying to be like dismissive or rude or anything. In your opinion, as a comic book writer, what is the most important quality of a writer for comics? And how does that translate to your own comic? Uh, visual, visual storytelling. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it's a visual medium. If, if dialogue is your priority or prose, narration, write a novel. It, it's, it's, it's a harsh truth, you know? And some people don't mind that. Visual storytelling, and, and honestly, like, it works out better. If you have more visual storytelling, you're paying your letter or less. I think that's the big thing. It takes work. That's not easy to understand visual storytelling. I mean, I've read some great... I mean, you you pick up a, a, a Spider-Man from 1960 and what are they doing? I'm swinging through the city. I just got off. Of, I, I got out of school. I got to go pick up Mary Jane. They're doing all this stuff with the way that TV is. Now. I mean, I'm watching these Disney Plus shows and 
There's no visual storytelling where it used to be that you could watch a bunch of movies and get the education like I did. It's like the opposite now, especially with these bigger properties where everything is trying to be the MCU. Everything is like so lore and reference focused that we're we're getting away from an organic plot. We're getting away from visual storytelling. It's like people are learning the, the wrong lessons, I feel personally. And then they make their own thing and you're like, OK, but. We have a luxury that novel writers don't is that we can just show visually we can show that's a huge every medium has its different assets and you're not using the the best asset of a comic book which is the art where you can construct anything of your imagination you're not using it to its full advantage which i think is unfortunate so what was an early experience where you learned that language had power i just hear certain things people say to me it just stuck you think about storytelling and stories and how every memory you have is, is part of a story. You know, the earliest memory is probably something my dad said to me 20 years later that I think about all the time. That would probably be it. Some, some innocuous thing that somebody said, but had a really profound effect on me even years later. I had two examples. I was driving around with my dad and I told you my dad was a sports fan. He absolutely encouraged me to be good at education. He definitely wanted me to do sports. I was an overweight kid. I'm overweight now. So I was running like down the street. He's like, look at him. He wants it. Like he wants it so bad. 28. So that's at least at least 10 years. That's a principle that I think of to this day. That moment really drives me today because I, I definitely want I definitely want to be a successful artist 100 percent. And then I was talking to my friend Melvin. I was working a bunch of dead end jobs. I just got laid off a labor job. It was like the worst job in the world. A lot of heavy lifting. I was trying to get into IT which is what I do now. I had an IT boot camp the next day. He was like, everybody just wants something better for themselves. I don't know why that just affected me on such a personal level. Sometimes the most profound shit can just be so simple, you know? I was like, damn, like you, he's right. Nobody wants to be worse off. That was my mantra for like a couple months. Like everybody wants something better. I want something better for myself. If you don't change your location, if you don't change your your mental attitude towards being creative in, in whatever shape or form that that may be, whether it's video or, or writing or whatever, you know, you're not going to be experience, be able to experience the joy that you maybe had at a younger point in your life. So. I feel like I still, I feel like I'm a grown kid. Like, to be honest, like I, it's still, I still like, it's a shame that now entertainment, there's a frustration that comes, but when I go to a con, I don't know about your experience at a con. Um, people are selling trinkets. They're selling uh, pop Funko dolls. Mm -hmm. They're selling art prints. Nobody's fucking selling comic books but me and like maybe two other people. It's like people look at you weird. Like, what are you doing here? Where's the fucking Where's the fucking dolls at? Entertainment has become so it's it's so based in consumerism at this point. I don't have that love that I once had. Like when Avengers first came out, it was like, this is something new. And, 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 and I'm a, I'm a reference to MCU. Cause that's, what's hot. You know, like why, why, why avoid it? You know, we can't fight it at this point. The Avengers came out, it was hot and there were other movies around. And now it feels like, all right, we're taking the bargain bin bits from Avengers and we're going to throw it up there. And it, it's kind of frustrating. So I'm like, man, like me and my peers are telling real stories, you know, yeah. we don't have a, a, a a box of references to make to entertain people. We got to use, you know, we got to use our brains and our creativity. I feel like just like I was a kid watching, you know, training day with my dad, 13 years old, way too young. Like I still get that excitement, you know, from stories. That's all I think about. Like all the headspace. I don't have, I might have just enough room for like my social security number. And then the rest is just like stories and movies and, and, and comics and, and video games, you know? So I definitely feel you there hundred percent. It's something that's interesting. I mean, you know, I'm 42. I've been, a, I'm still a kid. I <laughs> right. still love anime. I still love mangas. I still love web comics and comics and, and movies and TV and films. And I have enough useless knowledge up in my head that I can do pretty decent at Jeopardy. So, you know, right. it works out for me for Absolutely. Out, uh, to the point that my folks say, how do you know this? I go, I, I'm just a geek. Right. It's all we're on the road now, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's a geek. Everybody's a geek now. Yeah. You know, like that's where the culture has shifted. Yeah. I used to like read comics in like the corner, like with my with face in the wall. But now it's like, if you don't watch the new, I'm going to say one more time, Disney plus show, you don't watch the Batman the week of 
<laughs> you're gonna you're you're out the conversation. You're out the loop. Like you know, it's gonna get spoiled for you. It's gonna get spoiled on Twitter. Like it's it's crazy. And aspects of it are great. You know, I'm glad that people have a community now that they can talk to other people too. Like if you're a fan of Iron Man, you could talk to other people. But I think that's great. Mm-hmm. But I do I do want to get back to telling real stories, which is a bit which is a bit like rude. But I mean, it's 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 true. I crave like real, like something real, like this came from a real place of inspiration, you know, like I want to get back to that. I just, I just want to balance, you know, mm-hmm. like that's all my thing is like, I'll, I'll watch a, I'll, I'll watch an indie film, an indie horror film. And then I'll watch like uh, Avengers Endgame, which I, that doesn't make me special, but I just wish, be, I just want people to support, let's support it from up. Let's just support good stuff. You know, at what point are we good enough? I would say, I would say never. I mean, for me personally, from my perspective, you know, once you, once you feel a, a sense of complacency, um, I think you become a little bit worse of a, of a creator. Once you feel like, okay, I got it. You know, we can all feel that we're, we we can all feel like we have our confidence. We have a rhythm, but I don't think you should ever stop evolving. I don't think you should ever try to stop um, bettering yourself and you'll see certain people, they just get worse. It's like that lack of effort, that lack of inspiration that was there before in the earlier works, which is super unfortunate. So I would, I would say no, um, that you can't ever be good enough. What's your most underappreciated novel and why? The Girls by the Luna Brothers, I think is a fantastic comic book. The storytelling there is amazing. The dissonance that they use, like the comedy, like it's begging to be made into like a TV show, like on AMC or something like that. And it's paced so well. It's got beautiful art. It's got an amazing premise. It's unique. And I don't see enough people talking about it, frankly. So I would definitely pick Girls by the Lunar Brothers. What's something everyone should do once in their life? Read the case you want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's um, a given. <laughs> that's a given. Hmm. Uh, I think it's hard. I want to answer because we all have our different we all have our different perspectives. We all have different things that we want. Like somebody might say travel. That's something that a lot of people like, Oh, I want to travel. I don't really have an interest in traveling. You know, I want to, I want to tell stories so that I don't know if I had to say for me personally, what, what's on my bucket list, go to LA, go to the, go to the star of fame, you know, go to, go to California, I guess would be <laughs> what everybody should do. What is the second wisest thing someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you in your career? Um, somebody told me always be writing, um, which is which is definitely something that I keep in mind. Like I don't write as much as I used to, but I definitely want to get back to it. So if writers don't write, then nothing, you know, nothing comes out. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Um, my father, certainly, as I alluded to earlier. Um, my, my father, uh, didn't, like I said, we, we, we didn't get, we didn't have a lot of common ground, but we love movies. And so I definitely, my drive to make movies comes from my relationship with him hundred percent. From a professional perspective, you have created two issues. You have three more in the pipe that are eventually going to be created, which I can't wait to see for DK. Do you consider yourself personally successful? No, I, I would not. I think by other people's definition, yes, but, but me, I am not until I have a movie in theaters. I wouldn't consider myself a success. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I immediately look like, like failure hurts. So I watch a lot of sports now. Um, I didn't back when I, you know, when I was younger, but now I'm obsessed with sports and I look at athletes and it's like, they're motivated. The green ones are motivated by like the pain of failure. So whenever I, whenever I feel like I failed, I don't like feeling like that. You know, that's the worst thing in the world to me. So immediately I assess, like, for example, a simple example is earlier. I said that when I was getting my comic book ready, I, I got two pages from two variant artists and I had the main comic book and all the margins were different. And I had to pay somebody $300 to fix the margins. And that was that stung because that took more time that stung because the guy who was doing it basically called me an idiot in, in, in not so many words and 
it, it, it stung because yeah, it costs money. So it, it, it was the, after that, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm talking to every art. Here's the, here's a template. Here's a template, you know? So that's just an example. We got to adapt. You know, if, if you're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to keep getting the same results, essentially. Like I'm always trying to find a better way to do something, a more efficient way to do something. You should meet failure with like adaption or a self-assessment, I would say. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or another creative person in whatever field they decide to become. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I would just say, make, make a good product. You know, that, that's, what's gonna, that's what's gonna last and that's what's gonna go through the zeitgeist, something that's genuinely good. You know, something that, that in, inspires people, something that's gonna be inspired. You know, something that's gonna, somebody gonna put a, a whole lot of work and a whole lot of creativity into. What is the title of your film, of your life, and what is the soundtrack? Never Been Loved would be the title that I would have for my, <laughs> for my movie. I thought about that yesterday, literally. The soundtrack would be, um, I love Hugh Lamar, like Good Kid, Mad City, such a great, you heard, it's such a great fucking album. Like, it's so good. That would be, that would be it right there. Well, Anthony, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, I'll throw up the Kickstarter link in the show notes down below. Absolutely. So the Kickstarter, any any help is definitely appreciated. I want to keep keep making these stories. I want to um, take that money and reinvest it in resources. You can find me on Twitter at Stokes or Writer. You can find me on Instagram at Instagram.com forward slash Decay Comic. And also you can find my website at DecayComic.com. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person as well, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks